we, we live in a very, very exciting period in history. Maybe the future may be much more exciting, we don't know yet. But uh, the, the way things are changing. In the past, technology revolution used to happen once in a millennia. Later it became once in a couple of centuries. And in the past, it used to be every decade. Now we hear about new technologies almost every month or every week. And we have already achieved quantum computing. And singularity, which is predicted to be somewhere between 2040 and 2050, now having already quantum computing a reality, singularity may happen in next 10 to 15 years, 2030, 2035. Singularity is the time uh, period when machines will be much more intelligent than us. So every invention which you can see today is not by human beings mostly by machines and after singularity the pace of technological revolution going to be more and more faster and maybe by at that scale by end of the century we may become a type 1 civilization hope you know about the type 1 type 2 type 3 civilization on the kardas shave scale type 1 civilization is one which can take advantage of complete energy on their planet and have full control on the planet. We are nowhere near. We cannot control, we, 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 we cannot even today, humanity cannot even absorb energy directly from the sun. The, in our planet, only source of energy is sun. And autotrophs, meaning plant thing, they take it directly from the sun heterotrophs, the animals, we take it from the autotrophs, we steal it from the autotrophs. In the course of evolution, autotrophs saved energy and heterotrophs stole it from them. The balance was still okay until industrial revolution. Uh, uh, actually, about 400,000 years ago, Homo sapiens mastered the art of controlling fire. Before that, the people used to run away from fire, but they knew how to control fire. That's the time human beings started using energy for their own needs, making tools for uh, cooking meat, etc. So that consumption of energy outside of our body is called extra somatic consumption of energy. We are the only species on the planet which can consume energy outside of our body. And David Price, in, in his very famous essay, uh, Energy and Human Evolution, in the early 1980s, calculated that time the global population was about 5.5 billion people. The total kilojoules of energy which we consumed on the globe, he calculated that's equivalent to the work with, that can be done by 200 people for each person on Earth. 5.5 billion into 200. So that, that many number of energy slaves is what we are actually burning. So post-industrial revolution, although 400,000 years ago in China, the Homo erectus learned the art of controlling fire and started this extra somatic consumption. It's only after industrial revolution, the scale of energy consumption outside of our body has gone in exponential scale. And every year, every day, that number is going higher and higher. So if 1980s that was for every man, woman and child it was 200 energy slaves. Today that number may be 400 or 500. It, so the, the question of sustainability and other things comes. So I come back to the, uh, the Kardashev scale and the type 1 civilization is a civilization which can control and up, take full advantage of the total energy available on their planet. If there is a global warming, we should be able to take our Earth to a different uh, planetary orbit. We should be able to have 100% control on the weather, on the earthquake, on all natural calamities, which we don't have. A type 2 civilization is the one which can have full control of their solar system or their, their sun and their, and their planet. And the type 3 is the one which have more control on the in their galaxy they live in and type 4 are the one which have the in their universe or the multiverses so if you look at it perhaps uh, perhaps the vedic 
days. They talk about going from one place to another place in immediate uh, instant. Perhaps they were type 4 civilization or type 3 civilization. So, but at the scale of development which is happening today, we may, humanity may become a type 1 civilization un unless there is some very major calamity which comes and wipes us out. <laughs> so let's hope for the best, the, the, the scale of technological advancement uh, day by day is at that scale which is happening. And when we uh, rebuilding Kerala, we, you are talking about smart infrastructure, the, 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 the simplest explanation of a smart is something which can be communicated, communicable, remotely manageable, remotely monitorable and manageable. So you need to have two-way communication. That's one of the first thing. And resiliency in case of disasters, natural and man-made disaster. Energy efficiency, emission-free or clean, ease of mobility, flexibility in usage, that is uh, obsolescence proof in the near or foreseeable time frame, minimal wastage, and all instruments are interconnected and intelligent and sustainable. These are some of the very high level features of intelligent infrastructure or smart infrastructure. So, we today build all our infrastructure with steel and cement and we consider it to be sustainable, very, very, uh, big buildings which we build. In many cases, earthquake or many natural calamity, it don't survive. But in some of the ancient monuments, thousands of years ago, hundreds of years ago, they survive. In case of, simply Taj Mahal, when it was built, there was no cement, there was no steel. It's going to be 400 years. Many other monuments which were built even earlier than that, the ancient temples. Kedarna temple is maybe a thousand years old. The, the flood which happened in 2012 or something, everything washed away, the temple remained there. What planning tools they had to plan, we don't know. That's something which the old civilization and the current civilization missing. And this is something very important. And how can we envision and build infrastructure which will last few centuries, if not millennia? And talk about some of the big mistakes which are done in infrastructure planning. Late 1800s, London city, the traffic was, the speed was less than 10 km per hour. It was all, you can see on the left side, uh, it was all horse carriages. So there were many brainstorming sessions conducted how to improve the speed of traffic in London city. The London city roads were narrow those days. So um, people talked about one way, many other solutions were given. Uh, no horse carriage in some central areas, etc. But 20 years down the line, automobiles came, traffic speed in increased, it became 30, 40, 50 km per hour and everybody forgotten about. No horses on the right side, you see only automobiles. And today in London, traffic speed is less than 5 kilometers. Most people in that time in central London, they walk, prefer to walk than taking a taxi. So what are we, 100 years down the line, where are we? Exactly same time in New York, the Manhattan roads were very wide. Manhattan was built in 1800, so uh, roads were much wider compared to London. So, but the main problem was that Lower Manhattan alone had more than 300,000 horses. The biggest problem was that horse manure bringing by horse carriage from, from the outside of Manhattan and also controlling the dirt which is accumulating there from the horse urine, millions of liters of horse urine and their uh, ref refuse to be cleaned, which was otherwise spreading infection to people. So that was their biggest worry. They've been trying to look at other transportation options there. There was nothing. But it took only 20 years for automobiles to come. And on the right side, you can see there were no horses. All horses go disappeared in a span of 20 years. But 100 years down the line, again, walking is faster than uh, driving in most part of Manhattan. So how do we 
design things which is going to be 100 years down the line or 200 years down the line people don't make joke of us saying that the bloody fools of 2020 <laughs> designed this rebuilding of kerala they had a they had an opportunity to build something which is livable in 2100s <laughs> but they didn't do that their uh, uh, vision couldn't go beyond 20 years or 30 years that should not be i'll talk about some big historic blunder done in the recent times in 1984 rajiv gandhi's time computerization one of the first department which was computerized was the uh, 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 the vehicle numbering all the number plates were changed earlier you may remember you have kl klt kld klc and then four digit number each of those number plates had three digits for the state and then uh, a four digit number so they replaced that at that point in time some of the bureaucrats argued that people are mostly illiterate they won't be able to remember a number which is more than four digit so let's not make it five digit so they started with kr dash each of the registration office had one number and then four digit number and this has happened after the, the, the Maruti Suzuki, the Maruti cars were introduced in 1983 when more and more vehicles were still coming on the road. In 10 years time, we ran out of all those numbers, K, L, dash, 1, up to 99, and then four digit number we exhausted when we started with A, B, C, D, and now it's, I believe, K L 27 C A B and then four digits. Even vehicle owners cannot remember their number. That's a joke which has become. Simply if you had allowed that old number to graduate to five digit and six digit, that would have been much easier. It didn't, it didn't do that. Ten years down the line, when cell phones were introduced, grandiose scheme was done by DOT. They said that it's very expensive so many people will not have there may be many operators so they reserved only two level nine eight and nine nine those two levels were for cell phone and nine six will be for pager and out of nine eight and nine nine three digits for the operator they thought there will be some 999 operators will be there so that was uh, typically for delhi nine eight and 100 to 109 was reserved for one bidder which was airtel 110 110 to 119 was reserved for the other operator which was those days uh, sr which is now vodafone so and five digit for the customers the actual consumer will not exceed more than 10000 in each of those levels today if somebody call you you don't even know it's coming from a mobile number or from a landline because we exhausted all those 9998959696 pager to disappeared within 10 years pager disappeared even 96 there are mobile numbers there are uh, seven numbers starting with seven with eight with nine all of them are mobile numbers if you had just allowed that five digit to become six digit and or seven digit and kept that operator today there are not even 10 operators in the whole country these are all limitation in thinking and which we have not uh, learned that so i'll come back to the first one what are the communication solutions which we have today for making intelligent infrastructure which are two-way communicable so one is wired another one is wireless in wired we have the regular telecom cables fiber optic cables power line carrier communication plc which is being used on the power line, same power line we use it. And we have the broadband on power line. That, that's another technology. In each one of them, there are different uh, 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 protocols or different uh, technologies exist. And wireless, you all know the GPRS, which is the 2G, 3G, 4G, and 5G will be introduced perhaps in, by 2020 in India. We have the SIGBI, which is 2.4 gigahertz. We have the RF mesh, which is... Uh, license and free spectrum in india we have 433 which is a licensed one for specific applications and we also have 865 66 and 67 three uh, megahertz which are for uh, unlicensed 
where you can go up to one watt of power, which can give you almost a kilometer uh, or two radius of connectivity. And six Lopan is the one which uh, Government of India was one of the first one which uh, uh, among the few countries in the world which we've been driving for IPv6, Internet Protocol version 6, because we have exhausted all the IP addresses. India was allotted only some four, four and a half million IP addresses for over a billion people. So we are one of the first one to try for IPv6 here. In IPv6, uh, 560 trillion, trillion, trillion uh, IP addresses are there. Every grain of sand on earth can have an IP address. So we'll never run out of it. So 2015, we uh, issued a policy that all network, all appliances, and all content will be IPv6 compliant. And one of the two sectors which were taken for uh, implementation, one was power sector and another one was uh, financial sector for IPv6 implementation. So today all RF network which we use for uh, uh, smart metering and other things, we say that it should be IPv6 compliant. The six low pan is IPv6 low power private area network. That, that's a, a six low pan. That's a network which uh, we uh, uh, made it mandatory for uh, com radio communication for and the other one is uh, Wi-Fi communication which we all use for our cell phones and laptops and all that uh, IEEE 80, 80 2.11 <laughs> uh, and WiMAX uh, LoRa is long range uh, wireless again that's good for certain application that's a new technology by a, a Chinese company called Semtech uh, several applications for smart city, it's a very good uh, technology. It has low data rate. So like for electricity metering, it, it, it doesn't support me, uh, our applications. Then the latest one is narrowband IoT, NB IoT it is called. There are two flavors of that. One of them is uh, NB LTE and another one is CAT M1. So in each of the RF spectrum, it's also a, for collision avoidance, they leave some area. So when I say 865 to 867 is the spectrum which is freely available in India for any of this application. If I have a technology, I won't start at 865. I leave some uh, 500 kilobytes of that free, kilohertz free, and then start from 865.5. And I won't go up to 867. I limit it up to 865.5 or something. So leave something the upper end of the band and the lower end of the band for pollution avoidance with the people somebody using the spectrum and the adjacent bands so that can be intelligently utilized the nbiot is a technology where that can be utilized the one where the lower side which you use is the lte and the catm is the one which you use on the upper side uh, on both you need uh, basically a mobile operators help to do that so this is an emerging area very new maybe last three, four years, you have seen a lot of uh, advancements in this area. TV white space is another technology because good old days you had TV antenna. Today you all use uh, uh, the satellite TV. So the TV spectrum which is reserved for that old Doordarshan broadcast, that's available. So that is utilized for certain communication applications. And of course, satellite communication for entirely remote area in the middle of Amazon jungle, you have 500 people or a construction site where you need communication. The most uh, uh, economically viable option could be a satellite rather than doing any other terrestrial uh, technologies. So this is the communication options which we have for uh, making infrastructure communicable, two-way communication. When you come to the next one, resiliency in case of disasters, natural disasters, man-made disasters. So earthquake proof. There are designs which are very, very, uh, in case of up to uh, the richer scale, seven, eight, nine, nothing happens to some of the designs which uh, the number one is it's actually Shimishu, Shimishu Corporation in Japan. All the data centers around the more disaster prone area are designed by them. I've seen you can shake it like this nothing happened the server and other things they still stand. So I've been I visited some of the NTT data centers in Tokyo. Uh, they can simulate actually an earthquake of uh, richer scale 7 or 8 uh, and still everything function. So those designs are available, there is nothing, but Kerala, 
we don't expect there are no fault lines we don't expect any uh, earthquake so who are, who are planning infrastructure in area where fault lines are there where you expect it can be six seven so you have designs available that's that's an area which by and large we mastered uh, uh, i don't know i, I Uh, I, I, I don't know. That, 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 that's what uh, ge ge geological survey says. Yes, sir. So, so uh, when you design, then you, you, if it has not happened last 200 years, doesn't mean that it will not happen in the next 25 years. So, so, so make, make designs which are... Uh, uh, resilient to which can resist uh, six or seven or eight it's, it's a question of uh, uh, what application what are you building if it is a house for somebody to stay and uh, if i have to come and stay a retired home then I, I don't need to spend that much money on earthquake resilient for richer scale nine <laughs> so uh, flood proof i don't need to talk about flood you all experienced and the need for water to uh, drain out need to be there in the design itself create artificial lakes and ponds and water reservoirs etc fireproof again there is no big uh, challenge here there are many material which can be fireproof at uh, hundreds of uh, several hundred degrees centigrade it, uh, fire control techniques are there lightning this is also lightning protection systems are very evolved technology emf this is something which uh, we hear about a lot about in case of a solar storm the emf uh, radiation could stop all communication all wireless everything can get shut down we still don't know this is an area where a lot of research going on but we still don't know how we could protect the nuclear radiation <coughs> but again an area of uh, evolving technologies and research cyber security is a major fear today and there are no uh, actually the ones who do the malware and attack they are always ahead of thieves are ahead of police always <laughs> so so there is no sure shot way to say that it is 100 percent cyber secure so it has to be the design security or secure by design and regular update of the security compliance norms and the latest uh, is to have a, a security operation center or a SOC where as i said all the network today we talk about a ipv6 or inter internet protocol in any ip network you can see any intrusion happening you can immediately visualize we can immediately detect and you can also isolate the area where uh, an intruder you, you may not be able to prevent an intruder but an intrusion can be detected and it can be isolated that's the beauty of ip networks and physical intrusion we have found that there are so many I, I again come back to I'm a lineman in electricity, so I'll come back to my, my area. So many uh, uh, automated substations, small low low voltage substations like our transformer, 11 kV, 33 kV transformer in USA and all that. So people just go and uh, fire at them. If, if you uh, a gun is available with everybody, particularly many times it happened, people drunk and they fire at the transformer. There's a hole and uh, uh, the, the oil leaks, the power goes, the whole, whole place <laughs> in darkness, it takes a couple of days for them to replace it. So now all, all such systems are um, with the cameras and with the completed uh, digital video surveillance is there. And video we, we find a lot of video cameras in India also many places. You have hundreds of cameras, but the, who is actually watching? It has to be algorithms which are watching according to the rules. If somebody is loitering, somebody is left a briefcase, there are some cities, some solutions, very high-end solutions, even 10 years ago, then after 9-11, this became a big problem. Uh, Chicago was the first city where a digital video surveillance was done. Uh, later, it was done in New York City also. You leave a bag and move two meters away, immediately alert goes. You are you're walking on the street with a big bag, you leave it and move away for two meters the alert goes to the police fellows so that kind of video surveillance technologies are there which is algorithms are watching coming to the next one energy efficiency 
you hear about energy efficiency a lot there are a lot of technologies for making infrastructure energy efficient a typical building which we use in india consume 200 kilowatt hour or 200 units of electricity per meter square per year in usa most of the old buildings consume more than 400 and today's technology the materials and the design we can come below 50 and we have been advocating all this smart city initiative people it should be mandated to be below 100 that, that this, but builders they want to show it very glossy and very attractive so that they can sell it at a higher price so they won't do it unless it is mandated so we have to mandate new infrastructure which you are building should have a energy consumption well below 100 units per square meter per year and large campuses can be made a smart microgrid i'll be talking about microgrid in another slide and you you would be seeing in air, air, aircraft and in some of the hotels you have a dc grid it would, uh, there is a, a, a place you can charge your phone you can a usb drive a usb connection it's a 5 volt dc which is there in many buildings today which is there in uh, many aircraft today that is a uh, parallelly existing with your ac grid but we are in india been advocating that we should graduate that to 48 volt where all your appliances today a large share of our appliances are using dc your phones your laptops your screens your tvs many of them and even fan that there, there are brushless dc fans there are most appliances in a house or in office we use dc increasingly dc consumption is increasing and the electricity generation also from your rooftop solar it is dc today we generate electricity in dc convert that into ac and distribute it and further convert it back to dc and use consume it so in the two conversion we lose about 35 to 40 percent we lose so there is a business case for many categories of buildings to have a parallel dc grid in addition to a ac grid some of the like your huge cooling load dc may not be able to support anytime soon but you can you can have a parallel dc grid this is something which uh, we should do and at uh, bis level we are writing standards for 48 volt dc for in home in, inside the building applications and outside for street lighting kind of things we are uh, 380 volt these are the two standards for india we are standardizing so the first standard of 48 may come even uh, as early as 2019 most of them most of them yes brushless dc motors are there which can run fans washing machine i have not seen but fridges are there uh, uh, refrigerators working on dc are there in fact in iit madras uh, we work very closely with the professor junjan wala one block in iit madras everything is on everything everything is on dc so, <laughs> so that's how we standardize 48 volt and some of the rural uh, electrification this year we completed the rural electri electrification 598000 villages in india we have electrified so at least 100000 of them we could have done on dc they are so far from everywhere what we have done we 99 percent of them we have taken 11 kv lines to them uh, typically an 11 kv line should be five kilometers not more than that so but i know personally in some states 11 kv line going up to 100 kilometer average in the country is 30 to 40 kilometer 11 kv line so huge at and losses transmit i square r losses because of the long length so many of the villages newly electrified are all done on 11 kv some of the places 33 kv so we, we we could have ideally done with solar or wind or even uh, batteries and uh, dc grid could have been more uh, sustainable efficient look at this uh, i'll come to this net zero emission building in the next slide this kind of buildings which consume 200 300 uh, units of electricity per square meter per year this one almost net, net zero emission building net zero emission building this designs designs of net zero emission buildings are there uh, it's been there for about seven eight years now 
uh, you know about the US Building uh, Council, US, US GBC, Green, US Green Building Council, they have the Leadership Energy and Environment uh, Certificate, uh, LEED uh, Gold sil uh, Platinum Certifications and Terry have something equivalent to that, Griha Certified Buildings, which have some, uh, they don't talk about exactly uh, kilowatt hour per meter square, but some design norms are there. And the same uh, USGBC came out with a new uh, certification which is for large campuses and towns where peer uh, performance in electricity, uh, I'm forgetting the full uh, form of peer, this is some of the, the uh, Tata Power Delhi distribution, their area, this is the first peer certified uh, area in Asia is Delhi where Tata Power is distributing electricity. So this is a new uh, rating system. In some cities you may, some zones can be only electric vehicle. You allow only, like in Delhi, Connaught Place. It's, it's very likely that government may listen to the last two years I have been telling. <laughs> so may, one of the days uh, the Delhi government will say, okay, Connaught Place only electric vehicle can come or cycle or people walk. Don't come with your uh, regular diesel engines. Eh? Or, uh, so many area in the past had walk to work. So you should look at designing neighborhoods, colonies where you walk to work. And dust free construction, this is one of the most important thing. We build, we spend billions of dollars building new roads, new township. But after the road ends, the building start, there is some area which is left open with the dust and dirt. And why do you do that? Even in sub-Saharan sub Africa, I have not seen. If you if you build a new uh, new township or a road or something, it's completely carpeted, end to end. Build one side of the road, building starts. The other side of the build, uh, road, build, uh, buildings are there. In between, everything is carpeted. Even if there is plantation, it's properly done. Either you see green, or you you see uh, a, a properly carpeted or uh, area. We. Yeah, there are there are areas. There are areas. Yes, you look at uh, Europe. Most of the places they have done so well. Uh, the almost zero maintenance roads. <laughs> so here, uh, I am yet to see any new development where we have left. And Delhi pollution, fifty percent of the pollution is from construction dust and uh, open dust. Yeah. No, Kerala traditionally didn't need it because it was hill and so at uh, water will go to the river or to the sea somehow because because of the eh? yes a big issue because you are all, all, all the see typical Kerala had the party fields today party fields have all become malls and uh, other large constructions so all the water used to go stay there in the party fields which were used for uh, cultivation which is not there today so the, this is a very important point to be noted that whatever new construction you do, don't leave something open in between and do something which is sustainable. And electric vehicle charging infrastructure. So Dr. Sajid is writing standard for EV charging sta stations. So in his session, he'll be talking more about that. But the point is that we, we have recently uh, studied and issued a white paper from India Smart Grid Forum. We found that Electric vehicle charging as a standalone business is not sustainable anywhere in the world because of the low volume of business involved. You typically go to a petrol station, you fuel your car for 1000 rupees or 2000 rupees and it takes less than 5 minutes. In one hour, a fuel, fuel station operator, if I am operating a fuel station from one pump in one hour, I service at least 20 vehicles and I make at least 30,000 rupees. The same space if I use for charging an electric vehicle. Today most of the vehicles which are in India, you cannot do fast charging. That The batteries are not suitable for fast charging. Even if in 5 years down the line, we will have battery chemistry which are suitable for fast charging at 4C or 5C rate, 15 minutes you can charge. Still in 1 hour I can do only 4 vehicles. Uh, uh, the cars which are currently there have battery sizes of either 13 kilowatt hour or uh, 22 kilowatt hour. That's a, the cars which are being sold by Mahindra Electric and Tatas. 
and, and a Nissan Leaf kind of vehicle at 30, 32 kilowatt hour. When you come for charging a, a Nissan Leaf, let's see that a mid-size car with battery size of 30, 35 kilowatt hour is the one which are going to be the norm. When you go for charging, it's at 80% of the depth of discharge is when you go for charging, you get the flash. So 25 units of electricity is what I can, as a charging station operator, I can sell to your car. And Sir has given a, uh, 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 Sir is the chairman of Haryana Electricity Regulatory Commission. So he has issued a tariff order recently, 5 rupee 85 paise, 5 rupee 85 paise. In Delhi, we have a tariff which is 5 rupee 50 paise. So 5 rupee 50 paise, if I sell electricity, 25 units, it's about 150 rupees is maximum which I get. And three vehicles or four vehicles I do in, in an hour versus the 30,000 rupees which I get today from my fuel station. And they have set a tariff for the electric utility too. If I am an independent electric vehicle station operator, I pay to the electricity company KACB, I pay 5, five rupees 50 paise, whatever that rate. Even if I charge double, even if I charge triple, still each charging station is worth 10 lakhs, 20 lakhs rupees. A 50 kilowatt hour charging station will be, 50 kilowatt charging station will be about 15 to 18 lakhs. I will not get the return on investment even in 10 years or 20 years. So this has to be part of the new infrastructure which you are building. Every office complex, every university campuses, every hospital, every residential apartment complexes mandatorily be having electric vehicle charging infrastructure. That will not make even 5 rupees per square feet in the construction cost. They are selling uh, most construction at 5,000 rupees or 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 rupees per square feet. This will not add only maybe only 5 rupees or 10 rupees, not even more than that. All new buildings. So this is a recommendation we made in September and uh, there are some talk already that building codes will be amended to do that. And clean energy, clean energy, we all talk about it, solar, wind, wave, geothermal, uh, ocean thermal energy conversion systems, waste to energy plant, this is from the uh, a very, very re much required item, all the municipal solid waste, there are technologies which you can put everything into a, 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 a power plant which will burn everything and uh, convert into energy. Smart grids, micro grids, energy storage system, all this are which will make uh, uh, emission free city or infrastructure the coal typically we took three to five years to build a coal power plant a gas power plant takes two and a half to three years but a solar wind farm you can do from 12 to 18 months and th this is a major change which is taking place and there are many places in india where 500 megawatt 1000 megawatt solar farms came up less than two years. To evacuate that 500 megawatt, I have to build a 400 kV transmission line. That takes me three, four years. So th this is something very interesting things which has happened that we should be able to uh, have abundant clean energy. The present solar panels have a efficiency of 18 percentage, average efficiency of 18 percentage which the, the ones which are in university at the research level today have a well above 30 percent. So 10 years down the line solar panels are going to be double the efficiency or maybe even more. The, the smart grids, the traditional grid was only one way flow of electricity. W w there was no communication and the smart grid is where two-way flow of electricity and two-way flow of communication and I won't get into the details of smart grid. Uh, the micro grid is something very interesting concept which uh, evolved. We have heard of mini grids and micro grids for off-grid developments, very far remote localities powering them. But a grid connected, smart micro grid which can island from the grid is a new concept less than 10 years. This has happened mainly because of the climate events or the weather events which are happening in the US every year. There, in 2003, major power failure which happened in New York City or the entire eastern part of America, it took 16 days for them to restore. And many of the buildings, people were stuck in 50th floor and 70th floor for days. There was no DG set for the uh, uh, lift 
or any any of them even for the sewerage system or the water treatment plant or water pumping there was no standby power the concept of a standby power system which we have in every building even in houses we have uh, dg set or we have the inverters which is not there in developed countries because 24 7 reliable power was available for several generations so they never designed the infrastructure with backup even in military campuses they found that uh, there was no standby power system when today that kind of a weather events are happening every year and when that happens they found even the weapon systems don't work in a military area so it's u.s military and and uh, the defense forces and also the national lab and 10 years ago they started developing the, the smart microgrids so this is a like you take the case of this building can become a small microgrid of its own with solar panels on the top and instead of the dg set suppose we put some batteries or the dg set also can be integrated to the old when there is no electricity when there is a power failure from the kcb system <laughs> good yeah okay so when there is a power failure today what happens you you have a dg set which will be powering only very critical loads it, ac may not work but the fan and the light and the lift and couple of and your server ups those kind of systems will work the same way in a microgrid the load control devices are there a microgrid controller the most critical load which will work for a couple of days L less critical will work for a couple of hours the luxurious items like heating and cooling may happen only, only when the main power comes and many of those campuses today can have their own generation facility from uh, wind from so solar panels and also batteries and the something which is happening now is the electric vehicles electric vehicle batteries which can be aggregated as a virtual power plant suppose a campus a university campus where thousand people yeah please come So a large number of electric vehicles plugged onto the plugged onto the grid can be aggregated as a virtual power plant. The, the battery in the car can be charged and the same battery can send the electricity back to the building or to the campus or to the grid. It's called V2G vehicle to grid technologies. So vehicle grid integration is something which uh, maybe um, uh, uh, Dr. Sajid will be talking more about that. So the buildings becomes green interactive. You can buy, today you have a flat rate. In, in, in mo mo Most of the uh, cu customers pay flat rate, only industries and very high volume customers, they have a time of day tariff. This is going to be in the coming years, time of use. In Delhi, we, ha we have a time of day tariff for in, uh, industries and uh, other high uh, volume customers. But that is according to the peak hour defined by 6 o'clock to 10 o'clock. But Delhi for the last four years, we have peak in the midnight. That's an AC load in the summer. In, in May and June, midnight, post midnight is when the maximum load comes. So it has to be according to the use, time of use instead of time of day prefixed. So time of use tariff for in introducing that needs some appropriate metering infrastructure which smart metering will be able to do that so when that comes the building should be able to buy electricity when it is cheap cheaper and you can even pre-call it if 24 degree is comfortable which you know that six o'clock onwards it's going to be more expensive you could bring the temperature four to six you buy electricity pre-call it to 22 degree and run the uh, AC at a higher uh, temperature from 4 to uh, or 6 to 8. Those kind of uh, advantages are there. Or you have a battery you can save. Or the electric vehicle batteries there you can save. And also you can sell it back. If you have sufficient electricity saved, you can sell it at a higher price during uh, peak, peak duration. So these are all possible today. And uh, you would be knowing about India in a short span of three years we have been able to implement net metering policies 
all the 29 states and 7 union territories today have a net metering policy in India. So all the regulatory commissions have approved that. So if you have solar rooftop, you can sell it back to the grid. Today you can only sell it back to your electric utility. But there are places where you can sell it to anybody on the network. Peer-to-peer -peer trading. You can sell to your neighbor. You can sell it to anybody who gives you a... <coughs> Those kind of enabling the marketplace for smart contracting in real time on blockchain is something which is already demonstrated. <coughs> the first one was the Brooklyn microgrid in 2017, the September they commissioned. There are thousands of people who participate in, in the marketplace. Your rooftop solar, you can sell it to the highest bidder, and which is now implemented in many more places. Oh, thank, thank you very much. <laughs> so, same thing uh, in Europe, in Australia, near home in Thailand, uh, uh, Australian company called Power Ledger, they are doing a, a blockchain enabled uh, microgrid in Thailand. And smart, smart appliances, your TV, your fridge may, may not be TV, you want to see all the time, but your refrigerator, for example, the defrost load is more than the compressor load. And defrost cycle need not run during peak hours. But millions of millions and millions of refrigerators today, we have no control. Maybe during the peak hour when the, uh, there is a shortage on the grid, is the time when that also uh, runs. We have no control. We should be able to control that. The smart appliances of the future, your uh, rice cooker to your washing machine to your water pumps, they all should be able to contract electricity at the cheapest price you can say that when it is less than three rupees buy and run the, <laughs> or do the cooking so all those will happen on the smart contracts executed on blockchain this is one of the very very interesting use case of blockchain ease of mobility the minimum commute for daily needs this is better uh, easy to talk than uh, execute uh, those who know Delhi there is Gurgaon there is uh, Noida going from Noida to Gurgaon it takes two hours eh? so half the population in Delhi do vice versa stay in Noida and work in Gurgaon and or live in Gurgaon and work in Noida <laughs> so but there are many areas which you have seen that the, the towns were built such a way that ground floor is all shops first and second third floors are offices and upper floors are residences there are many Many cities which were built like that. Abu Dhabi was one of the typical places which was built like that. But now they are reconstructing it like any other city. So people need to drive a lo long way. Electric vehicle friendly infrastructure, which I talked about already, the electric vehicle should be able to do that, uh, charge it. Autonomous vehicles, it's already introduced in many places. The future is going to be autonomous vehicle. Nobody going to drive. I didn't learn horse riding. I learned driving. But I am very sure that my grandson will not have a driving license. He never need to drive because it will be all autonomous. In the good old days, everybody learned horse riding. So only those who could ride a horse could go far, further and conquer more land. Alexander came to India on horses. And all the invaders from the uh, Central Asia came to India on, uh, and, uh, on horses. So horse riding was part of the academic curriculum. Even today, you can see some of the elite schools of the British arrive on the hills. They teach you horse riding. And they fall down and break their bones. And our generation, we learned how to drive. And the next generation need not. There will be no own cars. It will be all shared mobility. Today, many times I don't use my own driver because it's difficult for me to get him. I have to call him. But a Ola or a Uber comes to right in front of my office in three minutes average most of the time. My own driver, I'll take five minutes or eight minutes to locate him. Yes, sir. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but but I am saying that uh, driving is a skill which will not be there in the next 20 years. Nobody will need to try. He talks about 
military, yeah. No, even people, maybe we may go back to horses, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> That's what I said. Uh, 100 years down the line, what is, we don't know. But we should, be, we should know what we don't know. <laughs> so, promoting shared mobility, uh, particularly el electric vehicles and uh, uh, three wheelers, that's, or taxis, that's where government can say, I, I, the government cannot say that you should buy an electric car or a petrol car or a diesel car or a red color car or a green color car. But government can say all new taxis in Trivandrum will be electric from next year. <coughs> government can say all three wheeler or all new buses of KSRTC will be electric. That's something which is well within the right of the government to implement and that's going to happen. So Shenzhen is a city where, the only city in the world where all public transport is by electric buses. So 16,538 uh, buses are there. I visited uh, this year in April in Shenzhen. Uh, and f for your knowledge, there are approximately 4 lakh electric buses in the world. Bus, when it comes to bus, there are only about 4 lakhs. 3 lakh 80,000 are in China. And 20,000 rest of the world. And only one city, Shenzhen, has 16,000 538 buses and within they completed electrification in uh, this uh, electric mobility or the public uh, transport in this December 2016 just one year afterwards in the 2017 they seen how many people abandon their car and they try to uh, those who try to work they take the electric bus and go to work 30,000 in one year 30,000 people stop driving to work. They take the electric bus. Electric bus are air conditioned. All electric buses are air conditioned uh, because the battery need to be cooled. <laughs> so when, when I was, we, we, we assisted uh, electric mobility part. Let me see that time. Yeah, we have a little more time. So, uh, yeah, we, 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 we will. The three, four more slides. So, uh, in Calcutta, we've been uh, advising them on the electric buses. They said, no, no, we are a poor country, so we cannot have air-conditioned buses. The tariff will go high. I said, it's cruel to put people in 38, 39 degree, 90 percent humidity in Calcutta, where the battery, I have to anyway cool it. <laughs> and then the marginal cost of a fully air-conditioned bus is 10 to 15 percent. And same uh, the ticket rate, the uh, ticket fare, we can use it if you do it uh, a fully air-conditioned bus. So one, it is air-conditioned, there are no vibration, there is no pollution. So it's a fatigueless travel. People love to sit and do their work in an electric bus rather than driving and fighting with, for every inch of road space with people. So that's going to promote sh shared mobility. And delivery drones are already there. Passenger drones are also going to be there. So I, by 2030 or something, those who land in airport will come to this kind of buildings on a passenger drone. And all of them are, I have a small video which I will procure. And the cars which will be vertical takeoff capable. So we need to look at uh, infrastructure when you design. Do you need to have a parking lot? or you need to have a drone pod where a drone can land. This is a very pertinent question which you need to, because most of your new infrastructure you are planning today will be uh, uh, completed in 2030 or beyond. So that point in time. So the electric vehicle, future of transport, see these are all some of the new things which are there. I have a video if you have time will show, otherwise uh, Velocopter, these are all uh, things which are already, Velocopter was given a, a permission for test flying in Germany in 2016 and hybrid flying cars, the transit elevated bus is just an experimental stage in Beijing and Hyperloop you have heard of, the autonomous car, the, the main revolution, last 25 years the life has changed because of the IT and computer, the electronic revolution and the communication revolution. The next 25 years is going to be the biggest revolution is going to be on transport. It's starting with electric vehicles. In the 1800s, we had electric vehicles, but once the fuel based, the diesel cycle and the petrol cycle became 
uh, more efficient, we abandoned those lead acid based electric motor vehicles. But the rebirth of electric vehicles, if you take it as sometime 1997 with the Toyota Prius, which was not a plug-in, but uh, it, it had an electric thing. The real plug-in electric vehicles started coming on the road in 2010. That time, lithium-ion battery was more than $1,000 per kilowatt hour. Today, it is less than $200 per kilowatt hour. More than 80% reduction in the cost in last 8 years. So, 1 million electric cars were sold by end of 2015. The next million was sold in, so it took 2010 to 2015, about six years it took for one million electric vehicle to be on the road. Second million was sold in 18 months and the third in nine months. And the fourth million was done this year from April to August, five months. So the pace with which electric vehicles are penetrating is very high. It has huge impact already. Total number of cars. About 6,000. Yeah, that, that, that one, the Riva is sold, it's Mahindra Electric, it's called. Now, the Tata Motors also do it. So, about 6,000 cars are there, and uh, ESL, Energy Efficiency Services uh, Limited, that's a government of India enterprise, has been mandated to buy 10,000 electric cars and give it to all the, lease it to all the government departments. So, 500 vehicles they have already given, which are there in uh, Delhi and around. So, the main problem is uh, the, the temperature. Most part of North India and Western India, temperature goes above 40, 45 degree and the existing battery chemistries don't function efficiently. So, that's the main challenge. There are only some battery chemistries which are very expensive. Even now, the, like a lithium titanate oxide LTO batteries which can go up to 60 degree which is still at $700, whereas the LFP and uh, in, in NMC etc. are 200 So. A, 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 your current car, the internal combustion engine based car have more than 2000 moving parts whereas in an electric car there are less than 20 moving parts. So companies are giving unlimited, unlimited warranty. Tesla says you can drive to the moon and come back will still give you warranty. Hmm? So all the automobile servicing repair shops will vanish. That's good. It has no lubrication. It's, we are not only replacing it with uh, uh, petrol and fuel, your, even lubrication oil, 99% of the consumption of the lubrication oil will not be there if all the vehicles becomes electric. And next is the autonomous, as I said, self-owned vehicles. Uh, they will come to that concept, which is a little more difficult. Uh, millions of drivers will be redundant. In 2017, uh, early 17, uh, our transport minister Gadkari sir, said that we will not allow autonomous cars in India, but he doesn't talk about it anymore. <laughs> so we cannot uh, prevent any technology from coming to our country. So accidents will be nil. Your insurance premium will be very less. A typical vehicle which you drive today, you drive one hour or two hours. 22 hours, it stands in expensive real estate be it your parking in the office or in the city or in your own home. It is expensive real estate it occupies. It runs only two hours average globally and most individual cases one hour. Adaganda Subay office jayega, evening you try back half an hour or one hour. But when it is going to be autonomous, the usage will be much higher. It is expected the total number of vehicles on the road will come down by 50 to 70% less number of vehicles because the, the vehicles need to go and charge only for two hours maximum and it will be a shared mobility. Do you really need big parking lots? Today every city when you design, you expect that 500 people coming to office, 500, maybe at least 300 people will drive their own car, 300 parking lots. Do you really need that when it is going to be shared mobility? This is a question which we need to have longer discussion. Same about the public parking spaces. And the most interesting concept is vehicles are going to be owned by themselves. Nobody owns. The vehicle will have its own electronic wallet. It will earn money from the transportation. It provides. It pay for the software which drives it. 
from the electronic wallet, the mortgage it will pay, toll and electricity charging, all it will pay. So like uh, 25 years down the line in a conference like this, you have to, when you shake hand, you have to really ask, are you a human or a silicon <laughs> with, with a uh, robots around? I think you would have heard of Sophia. Sophia goes around. Uh, she, in fact, Sophia is coming next month to Kochi. There is some event in uh, Grand Hyatt next month. Uh, David, David invited me. So David Hansen is known to us. So, uh, no, no, there are many Sophia. The one Sophia has been, <laughs> it's a robo. <laughs> so one, 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 couple of Sophias are there in Saudi with a Saudi passport, but the other one is coming from Hong Kong. <laughs> so that, that's the only, only robotic company which has, uh, Google couldn't acquire. Otherwise, all good robotic companies are acquired in the last 10 years by Google. And uh, David Hansen has not sold it, Hansen Robotic. Which, so you have to really ask. And in Nagasaki, there is a hotel. For the last two years, it's fully functional. There are 10 robots. Uh, sorry, 20 robots. And uh, there are some uh, seven or eight people in the. So if you typically go, stay and for two days or three days and check out, you won't see a human being servicing you. It's all robots. And any language they speak, for a robot to speak a new language, it's an additional uh, CD or an additional thing. So uh, two boys and two girls which are there uh, to, and there is, in Japan there are some uh, news channels where news is read by, in different languages, uh, read by robots. So that, that's a scenario where vehicles will also be intelligent and their own. Nobody wants them. And aerial transportation, I already told. And highways, if, if transportation going to be aerial, more and more transportation go, going to be aerial by 2030 or 2040, do you still need six lane or eight lane highways? Or do you need flyways? So why we are in, looking at it more carefully is because 90% of the new transportation things, these are all going to be electric. How are we going to charge? How will, as a, as a lineman, how will I give a connection to all these flying devices? That's why our interest and that's why we, we, we are looking at the space very closely. So last one or two slides more, flexibility in usage. I have a, a video, if you have time, I'll show you on the, the transportation revolution. So you design a building, most of the buildings today are underutilized. Office buildings are utilized only during the day. The call centers and all are, which are 24-7 today, the IT uh, services companies. But otherwise, typically, the schools, colleges and all are used only during the day. It's only the houses where people are around, by and large, maybe 24-7. So how can we design this multi, multi-use uh, with minimum uh, wastage we can uh, uh, convert it? Something which is designed for a all the mills, the cotton mills of Bombay have become malls or restaurants or something. But uh, when you go there, you find from outside still it looks like a mill. <laughs> Inside, uh, some of them have become exhibition centers. So how would you design things which you think that will not become obsolete? Or even if that particular function becomes obsolete, uh, some other function can happen. In our... Uh, oh, oh, STD PCO booths were there every street, every, 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 every kilometer you used to see that, which is not there because everybody has a phone in their pocket. Huh? Used to have video cassette renting libraries, which is not there. We used to have so many things which is within a decade, which is disappearing. So none of this IT or the call centers were there 25 years ago. It's all came, the new services which came. And many things which are going to be disappearing at a faster rate, I told about a couple of things which the transportation revolution going to uh, make people redundant. Next month, I have a similar session, two hour session on 12th of January on future of job. That's a very, very difficult uh, subject. Ideally, all the parliaments, all the state assemblies, they should be discussing about future of job. Which are the jobs which are going to be redundant? Which are the jobs which are going to be newly going to be generated? That's a very important point which leaders which uh, thinkers need to debate and discuss and reskill the workforce, which is unfortunately not happening in most part of the world. I'm not blaming only India or Kerala. Most part of the world is not happening at the level it should happen. So coming to wastage free, reduce, reuse, recycle. So these are all things which you know about. I'll come to the 
one or two uh, examples of that uh, multi-use uh, street light which you have you today you use it only for the street light which is used in the evening or night the same pole which has electricity which is a infrastructure you can use it for different applications you can use it for public wi-fi you can use it for security camera traffic camera pollution sensor navigation system for prawns in future pollution avoidance of prawns you may need something like atc so those all can this all be leveraged for that so street light pole is a very inter interesting building block for smart cities for a smart city many of the applications you can use that it's already there electricity is also there if you put a wi-fi hotspot you have communication also there and if you put a any other sensor you have electricity you have communication you can use that so many eh? we don't know this is an area which we need to talk so we have been talking about uh, iit tirupati a 500 acre campus given they are the, the director known to us so they wanted to design a smart campus for iit tirupati so their architects and their people came to us so one of the things which is told is that is somebody landing in by plane in uh, tirupati airport will not drive another one hour in the traffic to go to in, in 2030 or 2040 when the campus will be completed they will go on a passenger train so if he is coming on a passenger train director is on the fifth floor why he should land at the ground floor and take a lift and go so uh, director room outside there should be a drone pad i could straight away go there so you should look in that direction and do that so there, there should be talking about autonomous uh, vehicle friendly drone uh, friendly eh? uh, atc for the drones is something which will come and most of them will be self driven i mean there is no pilot license required for driving a drone or anything it will all be software driven like the autonomous vehicles that's a last one uh, instrumented interconnected intelligent the the smart thing happens uh, started the smart city or the concept of smart city started with a campaign which uh, ibm ran smarter planet in 2009 so the first definition of a smart city they started with instrumented interconnected and intelligent so all the here uh, many of the digital assets today every infrastructure has digital assets so which is appreciating whereas your physical asset is depreciating the digital assets are appreciating so and it can be shared kcb has a automation system for the electricity network in trivandrum city the same thing can be extended at marginal cost for automating the water distribution system in the city. Same thing can be extended to the gas distribution, city gas distribution, if it is there. All those can be done. Today, you may be getting a separate water bill, separate electricity bill, separate gas bill. Each one of them, you make payment. All can be one bill. The cost of doing business will be much less. The, the water fellow can give his reading to the electricity company because his money is the bigger one and they are anyway maintaining that system so their money what is collected can be credited to their account no you need the physical uh, reading it can be aut uh, smart metering or, or the automated meter reading of the gas electricity and water in the same same house same communication system can bring the re reading back and the bill which will comes to you will be one electricity so, so many unit consumed so much rupees water so many liters so much rupees you make one payment on the portal or on the website or by check also you need to do only one and same the municipal people the biggest trouble these days is i hear in city after city collecting house tax bangalore 45 percent people only they are able to collect house tax because most of the boys and girls staying there all the time abroad they don't even see the bill which these people that happens once in a year electricity people they disconnect so these people they pay their money but the house tax even if it's not paid paid you can't do anything so that can be clubbed for all the services you can have one bill it's so much convenient for them and a billing platform maintaining it's already there similarly if you don't have electricity you 
complain on one number. What are you complain on another number? For each one of them, you complain on different number. All of them maintain their 24-7 uh, call centers, which is expensive for each one of them. It can be one common command and control center, one number you dial. IVR will take you to, you said, uh, when you reach, welcome to the command center or a control center, dial one for electricity, two for water, three for gas, something else, uh, five, and then each one of them can attend. Yes, sir. Eh? Which, which is which is the the the, the, the uh, thing which is currently existing it, it may a couple of years it, it will exist before you go online and do things so i mean th these are some of the things which you can do today uh, and clubbing all this and in many cities these are all done by the same government different arms of the same government uh, kcb the uh, 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 waterworks all these people they can, they can, they can be clubbed together and the common billing and uh, CRM systems, the utility corridors. So this is a very important thing. Uh, maybe very difficult to do it in an existing city, but in new cities and new developments, it's very easy. You have one side corridor where all the pipes goes, or, or all the cables goes. Otherwise, uh, people don't even know. Every time it's somebody wanting to lay a new cable, they go and break a water pipeline or a sewerage pipeline or even cut the electricity cable. That's a common scene which you see in every city. So that can be avoided by providing that kind of a that common utility corridors. And each of these systems, when they uh, automate as an IT element, communication and uh, IT, and system integration happens. So here, when we are a concept of a master system integration, so all, all data from different domains on same protocol, on same f form, which can give much uh, higher value in terms of analytics, in terms of uh, uh, operational efficiency. So the concept of a master system integration in a city is something which uh, need to be looked at. So earlier I talked about that building where uh, the Some place I had written that uh, building uh, management systems interacting with the yeah, BMS, building in management system interconnected with the distribution management system of the utility and for a, these are all not happening even in developed world, but these are concepts which I have been talking about and there is no rocket science in any of these things which you had talked about. There are, uh, today's technology can do it. It has been proven, tested, experimented in different places. So. Sustainable in what time frame? <laughs> so if you do all that, it's sustainable, maybe at least in our time frame. So Earth will survive. Earth survived for uh, uh, billions of years. It will survive. Whether humanity will survive is the question. <laughs> so we have to look at that uh, time frame. 